please rise in body or spirit for the reading of the gospel. I'm reading Matthew 18, 15 to 35, New Revised Standard Version, updated edition, Reproving Another Who Sins. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you are listened to, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If that person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, you will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, you will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two or you of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Forgiveness. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. The parable of the unforgiving servant. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all of his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Please be seated for the moment of silence.
Welcome to Lent, a season that will lead us to life, but not before we deal with death first. Lent begins with a reminder of our mortality on Ash Wednesday, from dust we were created and to dust we shall return. And it culminates with the reality of Jesus' mortality as he is crucified on Good Friday. The silence of Holy Saturday serves as a buffer between the heaviness of Good Friday and the levity of Easter Sunday. There is a rising that will come. There is hope that will transform. But like Jesus, before we rise, we fall. It's in the falling that we are humbled. It's in the falling that we must seek another's help to get up. It's in the falling that we learn we cannot do everything on our own, nor are we created to or called to. Independent though we love to be, <laughs> we need one another which is what today's text is about. To be human is to make mistakes. Mistakes cause breaches in relationship. To be kin in the kingdom of God is to be in relationship, in community with one another. So you can think of forgiveness as the bridge between these oft-distant realities. It is essential. Forgiveness is not optional in the kingdom of God. There is not a family of God without the practice of forgiveness. And it is a practice. Even before, I'd like to suggest, it is a change of heart. I invite you to be curious with me this morning about this. Maybe we have been thinking too hard about forgiveness for too long. Wrestling with our ability to forgive, our desire to forgive, our wondering is, is this person going to be punished or have what's just done to them? Or do I have it within my emotional capacity to forgive? I wonder if we're supposed to just forgive. Because forgiving is the way of Jesus, the way of the kingdom, the way of God's heart. It's not about whether we want to do this. It's about the fact that God wants us to do it, and God has done it for us. So throughout Lent, we're going to be reading all kinds of scriptures, and they are going to challenge. They're going to push us. They're going to show us the courage we need to bring about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Hence our theme for Lent, courage and kingdom. So just a quick word about those two words. The Latin root for the word courage is cor, C-O-R, which means heart. In its earliest forms, the word courage means to speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. Nowadays, we think of courage as sort of this heroic valor, right, of body and force and might. But in the beginning, courage meant how we speak honestly with one another, how we express what we're feeling, how we crack open our hearts to each other. Just as an aside, that's what we'll be doing in our discernment process. Courage is about vulnerability. We don't need another hero. We already have a savior. We don't need to be saviors ourselves. We just need to be support for one another. And this is where the word kingdom comes in. 
The kingdom of God is first and foremost relational. We are spiritual kin. We say this every week at the end of our service before the benediction. My siblings in the spirit, my brothers and sisters in Christ, a family of God, a family of faith. And to be kin requires that we care for one another, and caring for one another takes heart. Full circle back to courage. So our first practice for this week is forgiveness. Lent is actually going to be bookended with forgiveness for us. We begin with the passage today in Matthew. We'll end, of course, on Good Friday with Jesus' own words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Both have something to teach us about this important topic. Today, in the passage, we have this early section that's really less about forgiveness and more about restored relationship. Jesus takes good care to show us a practical model of how to deal with breached relationships. First, go directly to the person you have a problem with and talk to them. Don't triangulate, don't go gossip to other people, go directly to the person. Lord, have mercy if we would just do this, how many of our problems would be solved? Nine times out of ten, I think this would probably work. But nine times out of ten, we go to other people instead of directly to the person we have an issue with. However, should it not work to go directly to that person, Jesus gives us some next steps. In modern terms, I like to phrase it this way. The second step would be get a therapist, get a mediator, get a pastor, get a wise friend in the room with you, maybe one or two, so that they can ensure you're hearing each other, to make sure that there's, there's not a bias, that you're able to actually hear what the other person is saying and repeat it back. And, you know, if that doesn't work, then you take it to the church. Now, the church doesn't mean parading in front of all of us as a gathered people. The Greek word here means something more akin to the spiritual leadership body of the church. So it is a bigger group of people, but not everyone and their mother, brother, sister, and cousin-in-law. This group of people ideally is trained to listen well, offer wisdom, restore relationship. And notice that throughout this process, the focus is really not on the one who has been harmed. The focus is on giving chance after chance for restoration for the one who has done the harming. Now this is not to say that the one who has been harmed should not be cared for. In fact, a whole separate process should be going on at the same time to care for that person. Jesus speaks of healing and wholeness many other times in the gospel, but in this lesson, the focus really is on how do we restore the one who has caused the harm. It does need to be said that sometimes the person who has been harmed can't be a part of this process because it would cause further harm, because the situation is so grave, and that's really, again, not what this is speaking to. We're not asking people to put themselves in harm's way again. We're asking ourselves, how do we listen and restore one who has hurt us into the community of faith? It's a great reminder of the need for restorative justice rather than just punitive measures or always resorting to punishment. Studies show that we heal in community, not in isolation. And the gospel shows that too. And no wonder this is courageous work, heart work, because it's a lot easier to lock people away till death than to love them back to life. To believe the gospel is to believe that every person is worthy of redemption, of second chances. We're not defined by our behavior, but by our belovedness. No matter how reprehensible our behavior is. This is really hard <laughs> to understand. So I'm just going to put it out there and say we're never going to understand it. So maybe we should let go of our need to understand it. Interestingly, the final part of this 
is that as a last resort, after these three chances or measures of trying to restore one into community, if the person who has caused fault still is not willing to make amends or acknowledge their role in this, it is okay to say they can no longer be a part of the community. Pastor Morgan always reminds me that to be open to all, close to none, means all people are welcome, not all behaviors are welcome. There are boundaries that honor belovedness. It's never just anything goes. And that's what Matthew is saying here to his listeners. He uses the example of let them be to you like a a Gentile or a tax collector, basically meaning let them be to you as someone who is outside of your community. But just because somebody is outside of your community doesn't mean they are outside of God's love. Who does Jesus spend his ministry seeking after and in relationship with? The Gentiles and the tax collectors. This passage directly follows the parable of the lost sheep, God pursuing the one who is lost. So that person, though they may not be welcome in the community because of their behavior right now, they are still welcome in God's love, still worthy of restoration. We are not to give up on one another. God does not give up on us. Of course, it's much easier to just write people off, which is what Peter is thinking. Good old Peter, we love Peter. He's the disciple that always says what we're thinking. Jesus, how many times do I have to do this rigmarole of forgiveness? You know, is seven enough? Jesus says not seven, but 77. Some translations say 70 times seven. Doesn't matter, it's hyperbole. The point is clear, forgiveness is never ending, it's a continual process. Our call to forgive has no limits because God's grace has no limits. What does that mean? We never get to say, I do not forgive. Not in the kingdom of God. Forgiveness is a foregone conclusion in the kingdom of God. Which has me wondering, again, have we been thinking too hard about this? I don't know about you, but for me, I'm always wondering, can I forgive this person? Do I have the compassion within me to forgive someone who has harmed me or someone I love? But what would it mean for me not to worry about that because it's not my call because God has already forgiven them and God asks me to forgive them. This is what makes the parable that closes this passage so fascinating because essentially it shows us that if we're struggling to forgive somebody else, that means we have not accepted the forgiveness of God for ourselves. Let me say that again in a slightly different way. Our ability to forgive others shows the extent to which we have actually accepted God's forgiveness of ourselves. So if you're struggling with whether or not someone else can be forgiven, it's really not first about you and the other person. That will come. First, it's about you and God. Do you believe yourself to be forgiven? Because as we see in the parable, the king gives forgiveness, massive forgiveness of a huge debt to this slave, this servant. That person doesn't understand what he's received. Because he goes around and he is unable to forgive the person who owes him a much smaller debt. The lesson being, we have been forgiven by God on a massive scale. And when we understand that, we too will forgive others. I think that if we fail to forgive, it's because we've forgotten that we are human, just as other people are human. We need grace, we've been given grace, and everybody has been given grace. Forgiveness is not something we really have to decide. It's been decided for us. So where does this leave us? Because I'm making it sound really easy, I know, right? Just forgive! 
Well, I'm challenging myself to make it that easy and to say, just forgive. God has forgiven us, so we must to forgive. This is what happens on the cross when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus is in the middle of being tortured and being put to death, and he forgives those who are torturing him. It is an immediate forgiveness, just like we see this immediate forgiveness in this parable. But there is no restoration of relationship between Jesus and those who are crucifying him. In fact, they go on to continue to mock him and make bids on his clothing and everything. And Jesus is not offering them forgiveness so that he can come to a better understanding in his own life and hold less anger and be healed. No, I mean, he's about to die. So I wonder if forgiveness and restoration of relationship are two separate processes. They seem to be. In our text today, we have an outline for how to restore relationship, and we have a parable about forgiveness, and it's Peter's question that joins the two. But I think it's a challenge for us to do first what God has done for us, to extend forgiveness, and to not base forgiveness on how long it takes us to do the personal, internal healing work that it's going to take to restore relationship. That process is going to take a while, right? We see how long that process can go in our scriptures. We know from our own lives that that process can be lifelong. But the extension of forgiveness, at least from what I see in scripture, is not based on that process. It's something that's given immediately and in great limitless measure. If you need to hear this message today, I think we all do, honestly, hear it in a new light. The time for forgiveness is now. And that's true for you on the receiving end of it as well. If you're wondering if you are worthy of God's love, if you are capable of being forgiven because of whatever you've done in your past, hear this, you are forgiven. It is a done deal. Nothing you've done in your past can stop God from loving you. Nothing you're going to do in your future stops God from loving you. It's okay if you don't understand that. All we have to do is accept it, surrender into it. Forgiveness is right now, for you, for me, for the person who has harmed us. So as we go into this season, we're challenged to act in like manner, as Jesus does, to offer that which seems to come easily to him, but he's human, remember? It couldn't have been easy to him. But it's courageous heart centered work because it takes vulnerability and it takes leaning into the heart of God sometimes rather into our own hearts. And I would say that the building of the kingdom of God begins with forgiveness. Until we get this and start living it, we're going to be hard pressed to do anything else. We're always going to be measuring who is worthy and who is not. We are forgiven first and last, and so we forgive others today and always. I don't think it's ever going to make sense, but it is going to be forever our salvation, the key to our healing and our wholeness. Amen.